Good afternoon again. Our final panel of the day highlights and contrasts the difficulties of the macro economy with the opportunities for investment in energy efficiency. Are there specific opportunities in a troubled economy for successful investment in energy efficiency? Can lessons learned in one part of the market be applied or perhaps replicated in other parts of the market? Can financial products tied to current problems in housing markets be generalized to help investment in energy efficiency? We're fortunate to have Catherine Wolfram to chair this panel. Catherine's Associate Professor of Economics at the Haas School of Business here at Berkeley. She's co-director of the Energy Institute at Haas, and she's been a world leader in understanding the link between environmental regulation in energy markets in the US and throughout the globe. Catherine? Great. Thank you. Uh, so we have a fantastic panel, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. I wanted to start off by saying a bit more about my own uh, research and how it touches on energy efficiency. In general, I look at energy markets and have examined anything from uh, nuclear power to energy use in the developing world. I do, uh, Max mentioned at the end of the last panel, I do have an ongoing project looking at the weatherization assistance program, and that's given me a particularly unique perspective on the difficulties of picking the low-hanging fruit. Uh, we're working in Flint, Michigan, kind of the ground zero for a troubled economy. And I've been there. And so the Weatherization Assistance Program, for those of you who don't know, targets low-income households, anyone under 200% of the poverty line. And the government will pay for it. So Cisco mentioned that something has to be simple, safe, and free. These are completely free, uh, from an economic perspective, upgrades to the, to the low-income homes. Our study is designed to evaluate this program, and in the process of doing this, we're trying to encourage households to enroll in it. And I've just learned how difficult it can be to give away $6,500. The legislated average, actually, per home that the government can spend is $6,500. It can, it can be above that, but it's incredibly difficult, as we are learning, to convince people to spend $6,500. So I think that does go to the simple and safe part. Right now, it's not that simple to enroll in the program to get $6,500 of, of upgrades. Um, but it's, a, it's an ongoing study, something that, that we'll hope to see the results of in uh, probably a year and a half at, at least. But it's definitely given me a perspective on uh, both the troubled economy and the difficulties of, of energy efficiency investments. So I wanted to start off with the panel by asking each panelist to introduce themselves and him or herself and describe how uh, his or her company or organization interacts with the residential energy efficiency sector. And also, just to lead things off, just t tell us a bit about w how they think the troubled economy is influencing investment in energy efficiency. Now, clearly, there are challenges, challenges to investment in anything in a troubled economy, but are there also opportunities that uh, they'd like to point out? So let's start with Tony Salazar to my left here. Great. Thank you. It, uh, it's nice to be in Northern California and at the university here. I have two strikes against me. I'm from Los Angeles, and I went to the University of Michigan. So, yeah, that's three right there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was struck out. Listen, I'm, I'm not an acad academic. I am not a person that uh, understands the, the whole energy efficient. Uh, I, needed a, I needed a dictionary just to understand the alphabet. I've been sitting here listening, and uh, it's not my business. I don't, you know, I'm not a statistician and I'm not going to give you percentages. Let me tell you what I do know. I know how to go into an urban city in the most distressed neighborhoods of this country and rebuild it and transform it. That's what I do for a living. And let me tell you how that ties in to what this is about. I don't just develop property, I manage property. I have developed about 17,000 residential units of housing. I house every day 50,000 people, most of them low and moderate income people. I deal with operating cost, and when I look at my trends, my rents are flat, or if I'm housing low income people, my rents will always be flat going out, and my operating costs are going up. I have 500 people 
in my company. All the young people that we've been hiring over the last eight or nine years have been young people like yourselves that talk this kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and, and they dream about this kind of stuff. And they, you know, for years, uh, I have a relationship with, the, with Yale and the University of Pennsylvania and MIT and uh, places like that where, where we've been trying to get young people to come in and do urban inner city development and rebuilding uh, cities. And it hasn't been until these last few years that young people have been coming in to our company. We've been able to hire them, not because they want to rebuild cities in that way. They want to make them more efficient. They want to do environmental issues. They want to handle you know, uh, energy efficiency. So what have, as we've now gone to, so my, my interest is, how do I reduce my cost? How do I make it more efficient? How do I save a dime in its operating? And let me tell you what these young people have done for me. Uh, I, I praise them here and not, not, not to their face. <laughs> is, is that what they have done is gone into our developments and they've come up with the following ideas. They've said, you know, do, do retrofitting, more insulation, better windows, Let's do all these kinds of things to reduce not just the operating costs on the common buildings, because most of my developments are two to three, four hundred units. Plus, they have you know, community buildings. I've got parking areas. I've got open space. So reducing my, those costs uh, helped me save money. We've, put, we've used the MASH program uh, here in the state of California for putting solar panels on top of our buildings. We put 2,000 units on them now. So I'm reducing the, the, uh, my energy costs. I have somebody's yeah, phones over there. Um, so they, we, and and it's, it's that big of scale all the way down to, hey, you know, the trash bins that we have in our, in our sites, how people are just dumping everything in there and we're spending a lot of money to haul them off. Why don't we start a little business and send people in there to re jump in, you know, do some, do some diving into the, the trash bins, separating them out, recycling, and then the savings that I get, I'll pay them. So I've started businesses. It's called Green Streets. You might have heard about it here in San Francisco. Um, and we started the energy company, so-called Solar uh, Sunwheel. Thank you. You know my business. You know, you know my company better than I do. Sunwheel, to do all these solar panels, and from that, we've we've done these these two thousand units in California. Plus, we've done a thousand units for friends. From that, we've expanded on into doing institutional kinds of things, where we've gone to other cities like Memphis, St. Louis, uh, uh, in L.A. We've done the housing authority properties, schools, where they've now putting solar panels using federal credits, federal programs, ARA money, any place they can get, uh, there's, there's ability to attract dollars, they've gone in and used them to, to put solar panels on them. There are opportunities out there that, you know, one can find niches and one can go make something, something happen. And it's a matter of being entrepreneurial. Now, let me tell you what I've learned about investments. As I'm saving thousands of dollars, by being economical and doing all these kinds of things that we talked about today, being energy efficient, uh, or uh, in, in, is that I'm saving dollars, so now my trend line is, is going down this way while my rents are staying stable, and I have savings. How do I take my savings and put them out? Can I take my savings and put them out in the marketplace to get someone either syndicate it, either get an additional lending, either get, it, either get money from, from Wall Street to, to apply back into the development. Because now I got, I've got real money, but it's not there. The systems for, for taking advantage of that uh, from, from, from investors, from lenders, from venture capitalists, it's not there. I, I can't turn around and use that. Plus, you know, the, the other thing that difficulties, for those of you who know 
real estate and transactions is that in my partnership agreements, there are savings that, uh, you know, the, uh, that say if there's savings, here's the way it gets split up. And one has to go back to the limited partners or the investment partners or the lenders to say, you know, you know that savings that we started, you know, increasing, I'm trying to leverage it for some more money. And they're saying, well, absolutely not. That's my money. I took the risk with you. You're making more money. You're doing such a great job. Give me my proportionate share. So the, we've got to figure out, because everybody's, I've been sitting here listening, saying, uh, they're talking about the economics. There's some economics there, but there's no way to leverage it or to get money out of the economic system, the, the, either the investment system or the lending system, to come back and plow it back in to do more. That's the focus that I think we need to make. Because a lot of what we're talking about here is strictly economics. It's strictly about where's the revenue, where's the available revenue, how much is it, how can you leverage it, and how can you make it go. If, and if you can't do that on existing properties, then all these things that we're talking about in terms of energy efficiencies have to be built into the development up front. And it, and, and it really has to be part of a development cost, not necessarily one of uh, leveraging the energy efficiency. Just like uh, Larry was talking about building a for sale home, all of that is upfront cost, and it basically gets sold and, and, and gets, gets financed that way. Two differences. Um, I should be quiet now, because I can fine. keep going and going and going. We'll come back to you. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Go. Yeah, thanks. Um, so next, Jean Clinton from the CPC. Introduce yourself and yeah, to, to describe what you think the challenges and opportunities are to energy efficiency investment in the troubled economy. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I'm here today in a relatively new hat um, uh, that's a week old, I guess. So I'm, I'm now a special advisor to the governor on energy efficiency. So that's the good news um, that um, the governor has made a commitment to have somebody who's dedicated to energy efficiency. Um, the, uh, I um, have been at the PC uh, doing work on clean energy broadly, including solar and energy efficiency now for five or six years. Um, let me st switch gears, um, and I, I just might offer the opinion that I've been working, unfortunately, on energy efficiency for 30 years, um, uh, go dating back to the 70s in the Carter administration, uh, when we had something called the uh, Residential Conservation Service, uh, which was an attempt to um, put everything together in one package to do the analysis and energy audits, uh, to s link uh, households up with contractors, to arrange financing, uh, and to oversee sort of the, the whole shebang. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a, it was a costly program. Uh, the, utilities were, the utilities were mandated to fund it uh, and operate it nationwide. This was not just a California thing. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, utilities backed out of it fairly quickly uh, because they weren't getting the bang for the buck in terms of seeing the energy savings. So I think, uh, you know, we've had, a, as other people have already said today, a long history of looking at these issues and trying to figure out how to work around a complex um, problem. Uh, from the PUC perspective, I, I guess I'd comment that we touch residential energy efficiency in, in, in numerous ways. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, we regulate the investor-owned utilities. Th those deliver about 70% of the electricity in the state, probably 98% of the natural gas in the state. Um, we oversee how the utilities spend money on programs. Uh, we oversee rates in terms of what customers pay. We oversee the low-income programs that are specially focused on helping low-income households either get energy efficiency services or get discounts on their bills um, to pay for the energy that they are using. Uh, we also have solar programs uh, and, and lots of other programs. Uh, we work not only on how to spend money and how to collect money, uh, but we work on policy and strategy too. And, and work very carefully with our sister agencies, so with the Energy Commission, with the uh, Air Resources Board, with the Treasurer's Office, 
um, occasionally um, with other organizations like the Community Services and Development Department working on the weatherization programs. Uh, so we ha so in that role of what I'd call policy and strategy, uh, as Commissioner Peterman mentioned, you know we uh, developed a strategic plan to guide energy efficiency throughout all the markets. And there's a whole chapter on residential, and there's a whole chapter on low income. Uh, we commissioned uh, a year ago uh, a study on specifically energy efficiency financing. What are the needs and gaps? Um, that report exists. It was came out in July, it's on our website. Uh, and it's an attempt market segment by market segment uh, to look at the value proposition, the kinds of financing products that are available and um, what are the gaps and what are the needs uh, and what are the options, how might they be structured? And it, it's, it's a terrific reference point for any conversation on financing. It's not advocating any particular solutions. It comes up with a short list of recommendations uh, in each market segment. Uh, the, uh, the other thing, the role that we have is to, is to carry out legislative mandates. Um, and uh, again, as Commissioner Peterman mentioned, um, in the next 48 hours, uh, we hope uh, that the legislature will pass the renewal of the public goods charge, which is a surcharge on electricity bills uh, to contribute to the energy efficiency programs. Um, for the very first time in, in that legislation, it directs us to put a major effort on financing energy efficiency to sort of move away from uh, a more uh, tr traditional approach to offering rebates uh, for buying energy efficient stuff uh, and uh, using um, private capital markets to leverage investment. Uh, which is, I think, the, the focus of, of this panel, is how do, how do we leverage investment? Uh, and that's $250 million a year that's collected uh, across all, all sectors, not just residential, but you know, commercial and industrial and institutional. Um, but a mandate to use that money uh, in a way that leverages more investment than heretofore we've been able to. So um, I think I'll, I'll end with that context for that sort of the, the playing field that, that I have uh, to work with, and we'll go on in the conversation. Great, thanks. Uh, next is Scott Henderson from the Clinton Climate Initiative. Hi, thank you, uh, Catherine. Um, so Scott Henderson, I am the Director of Finance for the Energy Efficiency Building Retrofit Program uh, the Clinton Climate Initiative. The Clinton Climate Initiative is a uh, charitable organization. It was created uh, back in 2006 by President Clinton. Um, the overarching goal of which is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in measurable and impactful ways. And at the time, the, um, the initiative had identified six program areas where we uh, aim to do that. Uh, forestry, um, clean energy, or clean power, uh, building energy efficiency, uh, municipal lighting, uh, transportation, and waste. Um, and our day-to-day -day job is, well, first of all, I should say we don't give out grant money. <laughs> Everybody always asks that question. Um, all of our donated money goes to pay for our uh, salaries and our travel expenses. Um, we've got about 60 people. We're spread out all over the world, 20 different countries. Um, we now are expanding to 58 uh, cities, so we'll have people on the ground in 58 cities around the world. These were the largest metropolitan markets that we had identified as um, as, as, well, and A, needing the most help or, or could use um, third party support in implementing, executing on projects that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, and then also where we saw the opportunity to be greatest uh, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so, two different things. Um, our day to day role is to work with a variety of different stakeholders uh, city governments, state governments, national governments. Uh, financial institutions, the contracting community, uh, academics, NGOs, uh, regulatory agencies, again, in an effort to identify the barriers to getting these projects uh, off the ground and implemented. Um, and then once we've identified those barriers, we go back and we, we develop uh, workaround solutions. So I focus, as I said, specifically on finance. So my day-to-day -day job is to, um, to maintain relationships with financial institutions of all stripes all around the world. So development agencies, uh, industrial uh, development corporations, 
uh, hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, commercial banks, lease finance companies, private uh, you know, energy and energy efficiency funds, some of those are, are starting to crop up, and to drive institutional capital into building energy efficiency projects. Um, we have focused primarily on large building retrofitting uh, to date. Um, so in the mush sector, uh, federal, uh, commercial real estate, as well as multifamily housing. Um, I will say three years ago, uh, we developed a, um, a loan fund uh, whose purpose was to allocate um, low cost uh, loans to uh, owners of multifamily affordable housing in the Chicago metropolitan market. It was a $5 million loan fund um, with contributions from a number of well-known uh, banks, uh, as well as some foundation money, other PRI funds. Um, and we were going to implement these projects using energy performance contracting. So from the likes of Johnson Controls, Honeywell, Siemens, um, had developed um, kind of a template contract that um, the building owners could use so they wouldn't have to um, be concerned about whether or not the contractors were taking them for a ride. Uh, these were all vetted documents, and CCI played a really active role in making sure that the interests of the building owners were, look, were looked after. Um, the banks, at the end of the day, uh, in order to uh, contribute $5 million worth of capital for this purpose, wanted a 50% uh, loan loss reserve. So um, for every dollar that they were going to lend to these property owners, and these were, these were vetted projects, we were going to have a direct role in developing them. There were going to be performance guarantees. Um, the banks wanted, um, you know, 50 cents sitting in an escrow on their balance sheet, um, which they could use to uh, absorb losses. Um, so as if that wasn't uh, difficult enough, um, in the 11th hour when we were getting ready, we had already spent months and months and months developing a number of projects with, with really good operators of multifamily affordable housing uh, units, I should say. Um, the principal agent for the loan fund then said, oh yeah, and we also want a personal guarantee from the owner of each property uh, that will make use of the loan funds. So that was, that was pretty much it. That was enough to, uh, to put the kibosh on the entire program, and we kind of put the term sheet on the uh, shelf and haven't revisited since. So that's just a little experience of ours um, in trying to uh, take energy performance contracting. And some may argue that, you know what, maybe we shouldn't have been trying to push energy performance contracting on the multifamily affordable housing market. But, um, you know, energy performance contracting was something that we had identified early on as being the best um, instrument uh, to accelerate retrofitting in large buildings globally uh, for a lot of reasons. The performance guarantee is a big part of it, and then also the fact that these contractors have got the resources um, um, and have got the global footprint as well, and we were trying to operate all over the world. So that just kind of points to one of the challenges. Subsequently, we decided to, we really scaled back our efforts in, in, uh, in multifamily housing. We had identified, um, there are a lot of organizations that are already out there whose, whose primary mandate is to, uh, to serve the needs of, of these types of owners. Uh, so they've got those relationships. They understand how the building owners think. They understand what all the barriers are. Um, you know, enterprise uh, community partners is one of, those, one of those players. And so we thought it made more sense to, to let the experts uh, play in that, in that market. So we really shifted focus, or stayed uh, focused on commercial, um, uh, federal, and overseas markets, as well as um, as the mush sector, um, where we think um, capital is still is not getting efficiently allocated to projects. Uh, so less than investment grade owners. Um, as far as whether or not um, the downturn in the economy has uh, affected the decisions of owners to do energy retrofits that they otherwise would have done. Had the economy not tanked, that I cannot, I cannot say. Um, we spent so much time trying to design these programs and these financial instruments. Um, you know, could have caught up in the in the so-called sausage making um, uh, of these products and these mechanisms. Um, and now is the time to turn them loose. And of course, it's not exactly the best timing. You know, we wish we were doing this in a bull market. Um, but. Um, you know, to the extent that building owners have got uh, equity in their properties eroding 
to the extent that they've got cash flow problems, um, yes, a lot of the, the, the financing programs that, that we've seen or played an active role in helping to develop do require um, you know, an equity test or a FICO score uh, of, of X in order to participate. So yes, that would hold back building owners from, um, from making use of those programs. I'll just leave it at that. Great, thanks. Yeah, so I want to go back to Jean and uh, Tony and ask you to talk a bit more about uh, the troubled economy. And so Jean, I wonder if you've been in energy policy in California for 30 years, you've seen troubled economies and you've seen uh, better economies. And I wonder if you can speak a bit to particular challenges that you've seen over the last three years. Have you seen, you know, ideas that have been floated but haven't gone anywhere because there's just not the legislative appetite to pursue something given the, the current economy? Or does that not happen in California? Maybe let's go for broke. Yeah, I, I, I think I might choose to answer that a little bit differently. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the, the issues have been the same, unfortunately, for 30 years. And, and the question is, is the market any different? And are, are the providers any different? Uh, and and I think we we do have a lot more infrastructure of, of knowledgeable, you know, energy efficiency experts out there. Um, but but I think one of the dilemmas is that the sales force uh, for getting energy efficiency into the residential market is not necessarily the energy diagnosticians. Um, but the sales force are, um, I think, something sim similar to what Heather mentioned earlier, is the, the folks who have regular contact with the decision makers. So, you know, the regular contractors, electricians, plumbers, painters, who are interacting with either households or owners uh, and are in a position to influence, you know, what goes on the shopping list of of, of activities. And, and so I think one of the challenges uh, that we have is that we may have a, a marketplace of salespeople who are not energy efficiency experts, um, but they have the ability to influence the sales transaction in terms of you know, what's going to get done or not get done. And they may or may not have sophisticated uh, you know, business networks uh, to link in uh, you know the right others who can who can execute, um, let alone put together a single loan that is somehow going to help finance all the different transactions that are going to occur under sort of an umbrella arrangement. So I, I think one of the the biggest challenge I think is um, from my perspective is is the lack of adequate business models for how to capture the uh, the trigger points is the phrase that. I guess everyone is using today are the natural transaction points in, in building life cycles. Uh, you know, what's the natural sales force? How to capture those when either sales are going to be made anyway or renovations are going to occur anyway or equipment is going to be replaced anyway uh, and, and to sort of get the right stuff done at those times um, rather than, you know, just the least cost stuff. Great, thanks. Uh, Tony, yeah, I, I want to try to generate some dialogue between the, the panelists. So I wonder if you as a developer can respond to um, Scott's description of the energy performance contracting, if you think there, if the banks would, would accept it, if you think there'd be appetite for something like that on the developer side. Well, uh, again, I think it was, I was kind of alluding to that earlier, where the more energy efficient, the more cost savings, the more um, economically prudent I become. And I'm generating you know, uh, revenue that way. And, and, I have an, and that could be leveraged to something else. Um, I, there isn't the mechanisms in, in the financial world to help me leverage that. They're just the, 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 the mechanisms from here to there, the instruments aren't there, uh, uh, number one. Secondly, they're the contractual relationships that I have already with the partners than the investors that I have for the building aren't really allowing me to say, take that extra savings and apply it elsewhere. Uh, to give you some examples, uh, we used the, the, the MASH program to generate in California these 2,000, uh, these 2000 units where we put solar panels on them. The, we used the federal credit, the, the, um, the uh, from, from the, um, from the utility companies, the rebate program. And then we as a company are multi-integrated. So we're a development company, property management company. We have new market tax credits where we do our retail. Um, 
and we have a, a social service uh, company. The, uh, the new market tax credit program provided that additional uh, money to create a, a stacking system where we had you know, the, the, the MASH program, the federal credits, and our new market uh, investments where we got from the market tax credits that we sold to Goldman Sachs, took the equity money and really filled the gap on, on providing solar panels in, in California for the 2,000 units. So it was at no cost, zero cost to the, to the development. And that was the only way we could get that done because we couldn't find anybody in, in the financial world to provide that, that. That's these young kids, man, they're so smart. Mm -hmm. And they provided that stacking, but that's what you have to do because using, you have to use the, the mechanisms that are out there at the, at the, from the PUC, from the state level, from the city level, any other mechanisms, and you have to stack them and leverage them because that's, that's the only way it's working for me. And, it's, and, and then it's a matter of what you do. Um, that's on projects that are built. And then what do you do projects going forward and making sure that now the mechanisms have to be that you can uh, take those incentives and stack them in with all the other uh, uh, kinds of, uh, of, of financial tools. Because that's, that's the only way they're going to get done. That's the only way they're being done now that I'm aware of. And I'm, I'm the person that's down on the street that watches everybody else flutter up there and wait, you know, trying to catch the dime when it comes down. <laughs> to what extent have any of your existing mortgage lenders ever approached you and said, guess what, um, the next time you decide to refinance one of your properties, we will, we will roll up the cost of a holistic retrofit project, maybe it's got a performance guarantee, maybe it doesn't from the contractor, into uh, that refinancing and do it that way. So instead of you know, the market having to design the next best mousetrap and figure out how to get around the lien issue, which we've got, that's the Achilles heel of pace, we all know it. Um, in this case, the provider of the mortgage, the existing lien holder, becomes the retrofit lender. So you immediately get around that collateral uh, uh, problem. Um, and oh, by the way, they already know the asset quite well because they lent to you in the first place. So if you can get them to um, believe that um, the energy project will at least be budget neutral. So the energy savings are enough to cost the incremental financing costs associated with the project, and they should be, they should be agnostic to it. Is that something you've ever seen? Because Community Preservation uh, Corporation, that's a CDFI based in New York City, they launched a mortgage program about two years ago uh, to do just that, although they made it even easier on people. Instead of, instead of uh, requiring people to wait until it was timely or advantageous for them to refinance, they offered a co-first mortgage um, to be underwritten alongside the existing mortgage. Now, they had to go out and they had to, um, they had to uh, negotiate with the parties that uh, own a lot of multifamily affordable housing mortgages in New York City. So they talked to the New York State and the New York City uh, pension, uh, pension funds, um, and did allow them, or was able to get them to agree to a co-first mortgage underwritten and, and essentially sold off to a third party. They also got commitments from Freddie Mac to purchase the co-first mortgage. So is that something that, that would be interesting to you? Sorry, and that was a public agency, or that was a private company? This was a, private, this was a, a community development uh, financing um, institution. So, uh, and, they, by the, and they've got relationships with all of the you know, kind of two to three to four to five story multifamily um, units uh, in New York City. Uh, and that's where they kicked off the program. But I will say, after checking in with them about maybe six months ago, they said the biggest problem was owner demand. They, just, they simply could not get building owners to do holistic retrofits. Um, they're still most interested in uh, doing piecemeal improvements to the properties. When things break, they fix them, as opposed to trying to figure out how we go really deep uh, to, to derive as, as much energy savings as possible and end up with a payback that's you know, between seven and 10 years. That just wasn't on people's radar. Yeah. To try to narrow your question down on, uh, are we refinancing properties? Yes. Um, are we adding, as, as we're refinancing, are we able to take out additional capital and in, in, uh, you know, leveraging the loan up for repairs and other kinds of things? Uh, yes. Um, and uh, I have 146 developments, and 100 of them are 
low income tax credit deals. So, um, and anytime we could refinance, and it's, we're refinancing all the time, trying to get, uh, trying to get, take advantage of the rates. Um, the, some properties, and, and I have developments in New, from New York City to LA and from Minneapolis down to New Orleans. So, you know, some properties need different kinds of repairs. Um, you know, and some, you know, you're able to, to ink out enough money from the refinancing to just take care of the structural issues or the parking issues or parking garage or so. You know, others, you're able to take a little more out to do some other kinds of uh, energy efficiencies and, 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 and retrofitting and those kinds of things. So it's, um, from the refinancing side, to, to me, it's not much different than financing a development up front you know, with, 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 the, with, the, with the mortgage initially to get it developed because you're rolling all the cost in. On the refinancing, you're pretty much kind of doing the same thing. You're trying to take as much money out, doing as much as you can, but the refinancing that they're doing is still based upon the revenues uh, generated. It's still an economic formula. And as you were talking about earlier, uh, they might want me to sign a personal guarantee, which, you know, I'm not gonna do that, you know. <laughs> My, my college education, my kids' college education fund is not, <laughs> is not part of the deal. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, there's this, there's this dilemma that's going on in the financial world about, you know, uh, strict underwriting that's going on and then wanting to push money out at the same time and, you know, and it's just not, it's just not, not, not there, you know. Uh, um, so, it, so, but yeah, we're, we're, we're doing that, but it, you know, we could, oh, and, and, it's, and it's working, but there again, it depends upon each individual property and, it's, and, it's the, and the issues that you have, that you're confronted with as to what you use the money for. One of the things I might add, if I may, uh, that we're doing now up front is doing a lot of lead ND communities that we're doing, which, if you if you're able to do it up front, it's it's you know you're able to push these things, uh, implement these things early, and and create uh, communities and, and villages that are that 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 we we now have several lead N D communities where you're able to do not just focus on the structures, but focus on you know pathways and shades and shade trees and um, you know uh, capturing water and dealing you know. Uh, trying to deal with parking structures and, um, you know, I deal with rental property and, you know, we, and we deal in distressed communities and God love my people, but they drive the biggest cars and they drive the most polluted cars and they drive the most, you know, the oil, you know, dripping cars and, you know, so, so how do you deal, how can I create something that has fewer parking spaces, fewer cars? So we're, we're doing putting things like zip cars, you know, in the community, so that they could, you know, so we can reduce the number of car trips uh, or, or energy efficient cars. Um, but things like that also matter, and, and all those kinds of things. If you do it up front as you're developing, you're as as, as Scott was saying, I'm able to ref when I refinance it, I'm able to reinforce that down the road versus trying to come back and and, and put the square peg in the round hole. Well, Scott, let me turn the question back to you. Why do you think the mortgage underwriters aren't coming up with the deal that you proposed? Um, the the refinancing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's actually one bank that is working on it, U.S. Bank. Uh, they're not doing it for residential. They're doing it for commercial properties. Um, but they are going to take a look at their existing portfolio, uh, mortgage portfolio, so it will only be available to the very best of the building owners that they have already lent money to, and so they've already understand the cash flow story. They've got a lot of faith in those, in those assets. Um, a, a big challenge has been basically for uh, one or two guys at U.S. Bank in Boston to communicate um, building energy efficiency financing as a revenue opportunity for the bank, um, a significant enough revenue opportunity that all the lending officers across U.S. Bank and the country should spend the time to learn a thing or two about building energy efficiency, which is no easy task. It's just not something that they ever learned how to evaluate. Um, and 
uh, they're not interested. Um, for them, the, the incremental value of pitching a, a building energy efficiency project to a customer that they're trying to get to refinance or, or a new asset purchase, it's just not worth it to them. So that's been one of the, one of the biggest challenges um, for them. Um, but we'll see, you know, maybe some of the more progressive building owners that it takes uh, getting them to, uh, to do the initial projects, and then if there's proof of concept, um, you know, and it, and it works, then maybe they can kind of roll it out more broadly and more owners will want to do it, and they'll demand it. I, I will say that it's, it's really going to um, be contingent upon owner demand. At the end of the day, owner demand will drive the financial product innovation. Um, bankers don't just sit around and try to kind of think of, you know, new products to spend the next two years trying to develop if they don't think that there's going to be investor appetite or borrower appetite. So uh, that's just one of the things that I've noticed generally about financing, building energy efficiency and working with, with financial institutions. If I could yeah. just make, make an observation about demand. You know, we've, we've estimated that um, we have an opportunity, I won't say we have demand, but we have an opportunity to invest at least $10 billion in energy efficiency retrofit in the residential market alone. There's an opportunity for another $10 billion of investment in solar systems for the residential market alone. California. In California, $20 billion if you, if you look at it as a comprehensive sort of energy improvement package. Uh, we can imagine doing that over 10 years, and so we're talking about $2 billion of potential investment that's largely getting ignored. Um, and would Wall Street like to get involved in, in leveraging capital at, for $2 billion a year? Absolutely. Um, but how do we create that demand? We don't, you know, it, this is, it's sort of the, the $64,000 question. Uh, we've got a lot of, the solar industry is doing a fabulous job of leveraging capital. The energy efficiency world is so disaggregated and it's an add-on or incremental aspect of routine decisions. You know, uh, whether to put a high efficiency air conditioning and heating system in as opposed to a standard one. You know, it, it doesn't scream at you energy efficiency. Uh, you know, and that's just one example. So I think, you know, this market needs help. Um, and it, so I mentioned earlier, it needs business models. It needs help. I think Cisco mentioned, uh, what was it? He said, um, safe, simple and free. Okay. So the safe and simple part, you know, is what we have to work on. How do we make the what, uh, a no brainer, easy to identify, um, sort of likely to have quality characteristics and perform, uh, and then we can figure out how to leverage the capital world. And, and so we have to work on both sides of the equation. And I think the, the delivery model, uh, you know, we're, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, Tony, would you like to comment on customer acceptance and what you're seeing from your perspective, especially whether that's changed over the past uh, couple years? I, just to interject a quick story here. Um, as part of the weatherization assistance program evaluation that we're doing, I went from house to house in Flint, Michigan, and just tried to get a sense for why people might or might not consider participating in the program. And it was pretty clear that people understood um, the trade-offs involved. And somebody said, every month I'm deciding whether I should pay my property taxes or whether I should pay my electricity bill. So if you can help me lower my electricity bill, I don't have to make that that choice any longer. So it, it just seems that, you know, especially in a troubled economy, people are sensitive to the, the constraints imposed by energy costs. And, um, you know, we talk about stimulus programs. This puts more, more money in consumers' pockets, potentially. But maybe people don't appreciate that. I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. what about your uh, tenants? My tenants? Uh, my tenants don't, uh, I'll try and describe my tenants, and uh, some, some of them do, and some of them understand it. I think um, one of the things about California has virtual net metering that, that we use here, which is critically important for sharing uh, and, and taking the cost savings that we earn and being able to distribute it. Uh, I don't know if you know, virtual net metering, everybody, um, but it's basically saying if I put solar panels, or I do energy efficient thing, uh, that, that the savings that's generated uh, on a multifamily development, I'm able to arbitrarily distribute that 
not, and I don't just keep it as the owner or use it for my common area costs, that I can strip it to the residents as well so that they have uh, direct savings on their energy bills. Critically important and that, 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 is, that really is changing the focus of how an operator like me is able to not only uh, take advantage of it, but also involve my, my, all of my residents that are there. And then they become interested in how do we, how do we co generate, collectively generate more savings. So as, uh, again, as an, I'm not just a developer, I'm an operator. So any way I can save and any energy efficient technique I can use to save, I'm better off and with virtual net metering, the residents are better off. So it's that, it has to be that symbiotic relationship going forward that, that's gonna be needed um, as well as the incentives from, uh, from government. Uh, all we need to do is figure out how to get lenders there and get, get the markets there and get them to recognize and create some instruments to, to generate more revenue. Great, well I think we have about 10 minutes left, so if there are questions from the audience to the panelists, we can take them. <clears throat> One bright spot in this troubled economy are the extraordinarily low interest rates that we're seeing now. A, uh, a retrofit project that makes sense at today's rates may make absolutely no sense uh, five years from now. So I'm, you know, with a with a refinance, I can see you know getting a fixed interest rate uh, um, loan. But I'm wondering about these uh, specialized um, uh, retrofit loans that people have been discussing. Are are these likely to be a, a fixed interest rate or a, a or a, a variable interest rate uh, type loan? And you know, ultimately, someone is going to end up being being hurt by these loans if uh, if they're based on you know if, if the interest rates can change I can take a stab at that one yeah most of the ones that I've seen are fixed rate um, and these are coming from um, everything from programs initiated by private financial institutions to municipally aided programs like pace programs um, all the residential programs uh, that had been um, developed and were starting to function and have since um, put, been put on hold and the commercial programs that are under development and functioning are also offering fixed rate loans. Of course, the rates are all over the place. It really depends. I mean, the, the, the goal always is, is to uh, create a financial product that is going to be competitive with other forms of financing a building owner might have, right? So if they do have access to a home equity loan, then what's the point of marketing a municipal program to them at a rate that is 200 to 300 basis points above what they can get from their um, existing mortgage lender? Um, and that's been one of the challenges, a, a program that we're uh, working uh, with the city of Los Angeles to develop right now is a commercial PACE program. Um, and um, indicative pricing, I mean, it's, it's really still early stage. You really can't know for sure what the cost of capital is going to be until you actually are talking about a real building owner. But um, people have suggested between 7 and 9% is the rate. Um, and so some building owners might wince at that and say, wait a minute, we used to go to, to the capital markets and with a bond deal and, and raise capital at 5 and a quarter percent. Why would I want to take your 9% 9, 9 money? And to which we would say, no one's obligating you to participate in this program, A. Um, B, the capital markets aren't what they were prior to the crisis. Um, and C, we're offering you an opportunity to tie the, the, the retrofit obligation to the property and amortize the project over 20 years and create additional cash flow in, in, the, meaning, in the meantime. We think that's a pretty good deal. So, um, but no, fixed rates, um, pretty much what I've seen. Um, the Keystone Help Program, which the Pennsylvania Treasury has got in place, provides secured and unsecured financing to residential homeowners. Um, and the rates can be anywhere from 3 to 9% based on the project. Um, terms of 3, 5, 10, 15, or 20 years. So a lot of flexibility, right? I mean, you could scope any kind of project um, and, and structure it such that the energy savings uh, more than uh, cover the cost of financing. And loan size is between $1,000 and $35,000. Um, so, but yeah, maybe variable interest rates are something worth looking into. It really depends upon the program, though, in terms of your ability to do that. 
So, uh, hi, my name is Tara Siegel, and I'm more than asking a question, going to help address the question that was just asked as well. Um, I work for the Low Income Investment Fund, which is a community development finance institution. I'm our green program manager, and we're partnered with Enterprise Community Partners and San Francisco's Mayor's Office of Housing, administering an energy efficiency retrofit loan fund um, for multifamily affordable housing here in the Bay Area. And I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said here today about the challenges that we faced. Um, other than to say that we, our fund structure has gone through several iterations to the point that we have a structure now that it's a 5% interest rate 10-year ten ter term, um, unsec the prop unsecured to the property, non-recourse to the borrower, no guarantee required. required. Um, essentially, yes, we, you know, so you see where I'm going with this. Um, and it's a limited time deal because there are RF funds that are funding this. Um, so the question is, as we quickly approach this March 2012 date is how, you know, the, the impetus of these programs as we started two years ago was to try to set the groundwork um, and the framework for something that would be scalable and sustainable beyond the March 2012 ARA dollars. And um, we're quickly approaching that deadline and we have not found the model that we have now will not be scalable um, beyond the dollars because we are being subsidized by government funds. We have not only were we, do we have a 50% top loss by the state energy program dollars, Lyft and Enterprise have raised additional capital on our own to create a fully credit enhanced product. So that essentially removing all risk from the borrower um, because another big component to these programs is trying to collect the data to prove these models out. So one thing that we are seeing moving forward, what we're starting to think about is, is and especially in terms of talking to our borrowers, is this the, these trigger points. These, um, when we reach projects that are going re, um, refinancing, syndication, that we look at how do we, how do we take our funds um, in the CDFI community to help leverage other, you know, leverage those funds to either buy down interest rates to provide further credit enhancement to incentivize those energy efficiency items to happen. Um, I don't think we see a model where just financing energy retrofits alone as a, as a funding mechanism is gonna be successful. I think we do need to find a way to work with, our, with other existing lending products um, because, um, because, and until we collect data that can really support or show that this is working, that the market's gonna be tepid. Even as Larry mentioned, I think just in his keynote speak during, you know, right after lunch, where he said, well, yeah, you know, 86% 86, 86 of the folks we talked to said they were interested in energy efficiency, but they didn't wanna pay for it. We found the same thing in the multifamily sector. Of course, everyone wants to do it, but nobody asked the question, are you willing to take on debt to, to, to make these improvements? Um, and, and something that hasn't really been discussed here today, or it's been touched upon, but the um, administrative burden, both for the, for the asset managers, the, the lenders, um, the program management, all the assessments and everything that needs to happen to a company, um, the financing, is um, it, 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 cancel, it almost cancels out the cost effectiveness of it not even looking at the energy efficiency cost effectiveness alone. And I'd also like to say to everybody in the room that we need to be conscious of keeping in mind the distinction between energy unit savings and energy cost savings. Because when you're speaking to lenders and financers, we are looking at the cost savings. And I know as we all speak here about it today, it's very easy to just say energy savings, energy savings. And I think we need to be very clear about that distinction. Because fuel who's going to take on the, the risk of fuel costs? Is it going to be the, the property owner or is it going to be the lender? You could be achieving savings, but you may not actually see that decrease in your bill, depending on what, what, how costs are. So um, I hope that, I don't know if that really answers where we're going, but obviously there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> point. I mean, I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to develop standardized protocols for measurement and verification of energy improvements. So we know that the energy savings are actually accruing as a result of the projects themselves. Uh, we, you know, we've got the IP MVP protocols, which are uh, useful for large building projects, but the cost would be prohibitive once you get into single family residential. So I would love to see the federal government um, kind of, you know, run with the ball on developing a standardized, a, a kind of a, a really intelligent, well thought out, standardized M and V protocol for the residential sector, because as it is right now, people who are providing capital for projects in those building types are doing so based upon the amount of security that they are able to get in the, with their investment, 
um, and the credit profile of the building owner. It has a lot less to do with um, how well the energy project was designed, right? And that shouldn't be the case. That should be a factor in the equation. But right now, it's if you don't have good credit, you don't have equity in the property, um, and the financial institution can't secure his, his loan, he's not going to do it. Or do you, either Gene or Tony, you want to respond, comment on those comments? No, I, I love the program and <laughs> love to talk to you about it. I mean, that, what, you, what you described was different than what Scott described earlier about Chicago, which was just the opposite of, you know, they want a personal guarantee from me. It's recourse. And, you know, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a property that has, you know, let's say it's a tax credit deal. Um, the, the rents are restricted. The operating costs are, are restricted. The you know there's there's so much regulation there that there's very little wiggle room to even borrow. Right. You know, so. Exactly. So and it's it's part of the evolution of you know the two extremes. But how, how does everyone move together and evolve into something where we have all the capital markets playing? I, I, I sit on the board of, Enterpri of Enterprise, and I, I'm just one last thought. I, I don't know where that is, nor, nor do I know how it's going to involve, but I just know that it needs to in order to, in order to include uh, a lot of the properties that really need to be part of uh, this program and take advantage of, of it. Yeah. Scott, last. No, I'll let, I'll let Jean. So Go I if she has thoughts. Thank, no. I wanted to thank Catherine, and I wanted to thank this panel for taking on this challenging and most challenging um, aspect of the day's program. Um, I will we'll take a, a, a two-minute stretch in place while we rearrange the front, but don't go anyplace. Just stand on your tippy toes for two minutes, and we're all set. <laughs>